Hi everybody and welcome to this portion of our virtual revisit day for spring 2020. My name is Sarah Mulrooney. I'm the Dean of Academic Life. I live here on the hilltop with my wife Rebecca and our 11 and a half year old son Ryer. He thinks this is the greatest place in the world. He has over 300 big brothers and we're very happy here as a family. I'm going to talk to you today about teaching boys um, and you know that is something that is so so important to everything that we do here at Salisbury School. And I wish we could all be together. I wish I could answer your questions live and in person. But if there's anything I talk about or anything that I don't talk about that you want to know more about, please do reach out, uh, email, phone, or we could even set up a Zoom call. I'm happy to help. I'm going to start with a little story. Um, I think personal stories are a great way to build relationships, and that's important to me. So about a year ago, my family and I traveled to Universal Studios down in Florida. We're big Harry Potter fans, and uh, here's a gratuitous picture of my sweet guy uh, sipping on his first butter beer. There was an arcade in the hotel, and Ryer really wanted to go, so I finally took him one evening. And we got to that part of the evening where uh, he had his card with points on it, and he was up against that that glass case with all of the, the trinkets and the toys. And there were a lot of people around kind of pushing and shoving. So I sort of instinctively wrapped my arms around the front of his body and his heart was just pounding, pounding, pounding. So I leaned down and I said, Ryer, your heart is going crazy. And he looked up at me and he said, I know, I'm just so excited, just like that. And I was reminded of this moment not long after that when I was reading from Michael Reichert's new book, How to Raise a Boy. He's a phenomenal thinker, author, researcher, and writer um, about all things educating and mentoring boys. We, we refer to his work a lot in our work here at Salisbury School. I want to uh, read a couple things to you so that you have a sense for what I'm talking about. Reichert explains how the paradigms about boys needing to be stoic and manly can actually cause them to shut down, leading to anger, isolation, or disrespectful or even destructive behaviors. The key to changing the culture is lies in how parents, educators, and mentors help boys develop socially and emotionally. And here's the quote that reminded me of that moment with my son. He writes, we will find ready partners in boys themselves who have a keen interest in being seen as they are, hearts beating loudly behind the masks they must wear. Now I know that when Ryer is a teenager, a little older in high school, he may reveal less to me about his true emotions as he did that evening in the arcade but his heart's still gonna be pounding beneath his chest, just like it does now. And the key to educating boys requires getting past the mask and straight to the heart. And we do that by starting with the relationship. This is a picture of Trevor Reese, one of our English teachers, and Liam, a young man who graduated from Salisbury last year. It, it was taken on, on a Halloween a couple years ago. They dressed up as each other. The simplicity of the costumes was what was so epic about them. They just picked some small elements that represented their strong identities, swapped them, and it was clear to everybody what they were doing. Mr. Reese is always carrying around the New York Times crossword puzzle. Liam's always wearing that red hat. It was wonderful. They didn't have to say anything. We all knew what the gag was. Now, besides crossword puzzles and cosplay, uh, Mr. Reese does a lot of other things to build relationships with his students. He meets them at the door on the way into the classroom every single day just to make sure that the day is going well, to get a glimpse of whether it might not be. He coaches them in, in tennis or squash. He invites them over to play backgammon. He invites them over to his home for cookies or to visit with his little dog Phoebe or to visit with his and his wife's new son, George. All of these relational gestures matter so much in our interactions with boys and they're fundamental to success as it translates in the classroom. Boys experience their teachers before they experience the lessons they teach. Let me say that one more time. Boys experience their teachers before they experience the lessons that they teach. And because of that, we know that if we reach out and improvise in meeting the unique and individual needs of our students, we maintain consistent expectations, respond to their personal interests and talents, or share common interests and traits, disclose appropriate personal aspects of our lives, accommodate a measure of opposition, and reveal vulnerability, um, they will know that we care, and then we can get down to the business of asking them to care about what we know. And in the boarding environment, we get even more opportunities to build this relationship. 
We invite boys to our homes for meals. We cheer them on in a big game. We chat in the dorms late at night in front of the TV, everybody in sweatpants. We create the kinds of connections that you see so obviously through one look at this image. Another key element to teaching boys is using the right methodologies. Really smart people who focus solely on how boys learn, such as those at the Center for the Study of Boys or the International Boys School Coalition, have affirmed that when we craft learning experiences that involve creating products, lessons as games, uh, motor activity or hands-on learning, play and performance, open inquiry, teamwork and competition, making personal connections, or incorporating something new that they haven't seen before, that we're going to be far more successful to help boys learn than that old sage on the stage, I talk, you take notes method of teaching that was so prevalent um, before. And because we know that that's true, we strive to incorporate these methodologies across the curriculum. I'm going to unpack that by sharing two examples of projects that, recent projects that illustrate these ideas well. Um, they're two of just many, but they provide a great glimpse into what it looks like in our classrooms. Algebra 2 students recently explored quadratic functions in the real world. They began by researching the time and distance required for an actual roller coaster in the real world to fall from its highest hill. They had to answer questions like, what is the height of the roller coaster at the tallest drop? After how many seconds does the coaster reach the bottom? What is the average velocity of the coaster from its highest point until it reaches the bottom? And then students used this activity as a guide to design their own roller coaster. They were graded on their research work, collaboration and engagement, design features and their accompanying graphs, sketches drawn to scale, a poster, a social media post advertising about their poster, their coaster, and the testing run in live simulation. And then in the honors level class, they extended the unit and applied their, nom their knowledge of polynomial functions as well. These photos were taken on day one of the build process. It's so great to see these boys up and out of their seats in a math classroom. And in some cases, out of the classroom itself, like Tobias and Ryan here. They, they worked in teams to discover the efficacy of their designs, reflecting and iterating. And that's where the true learning happens. There were so many aha moments for the students as they used their scale drawings to write out their own quadratic equations and test them out. The project helped enhance and apply their understanding of stretching and compressing shapes, as well as transformations. Students were able to be creative and to grapple with the physics behind testing their coasters. Skill building in research and writing are foundational in the history curriculum. This winter, the third form ancient history students began their study of ancient Greece by researching an assigned city-state. They became experts on areas of specialization like government, economy and trade, religion or art and culture within a specific city-state, Corinth, Argos or Syracuse, during the time of the Peloponnesian Wars. They used their research to create annotated bibliographies and then to write a research paper. Now, typically this is where it all ends, right? The teacher grades the paper, gives it back, and it ends up at the bottom of a backpack or at the back of a folder somewhere. But we didn't want it to end there. So we asked them to represent their learning through creating a replica of the city-state they researched using Minecraft. So here we have a bird's eye view of one class's interpretation of the city of Corinth. You can see bustling ports, uh, a government where a, a building where government takes place, the agora, hippodrome, a theater, a variety of types of houses to represent the different social classes in Corinth, and of course uh, temples to the patron goddess Aphrodite, or goddess Sclepius, or the god Apollo. A key fascinating feature of Corinth was this road here, which was called the Diolkos. Um, it connected the two ports that straddled the Isthmus of Corinth. Now today, Corinth has a canal, but that wasn't built until the 19th century. Since the journey to sail around the Peloponnese Peninsula was notoriously treacherous, uh, many would sail to one port, take the ship out of the water, drag it across the Diolkos, and then put it back in the water on the other side. 
the boys' inclusion of this feature in their creation demonstrated their deep understanding of the role that geography played in setting up Corinth as an economic powerhouse in the ancient world. Each class needed to combine their different areas of expertise, working together to build something that reflected all that they had learned throughout their research. Upon completion, each section presented their work to the whole form, um, special guests, and a panel of judges. The judges looked for authenticity, evidence of research-based creative choices, certain required elements, and of course, presentational skills. This project, like the roller coasters, not only gave the students opportunities to flex their content-specific skills, but also to work on the broader skills that we know are essential for success in the world of work. Creativity, collaboration, design and iteration, problem solving, and communication. A final key to teaching boys is understanding that they will elicit the kind of pedagogy they need. In other words, when it's not working, it's visible. If it's not working, boys will be disengaged, inattentive, or even obstructive in response. Because of that reality, boys really know what they need, and if you ask them, they can tell you. Last year, we did a survey of our students, asking them to reflect on the qualities of a successful teacher. I plugged in their anecdotal responses into an application that created this word cloud, so the words that appeared the most show up as the largest. And as we look at this, we can see evidence of the significance of relational teaching and learning to our boys. Words like believe, help, know, time, extra, offer, and care. We can also see that they value learning experiences that invite them out of their seats and into a space where they can make real meaning of their work. Different, deeper, better, engaged, fun, and active. This guides all that we do. We begin always with the relationship. We research and use methodologies proven to work best for boys, and we pay attention to their feedback, whether it's gathered by asking them explicitly or from our careful observation of how they respond to what we offer. I am grateful for the time that you have taken to view this presentation. Um, and I really, I encourage you to reach out if you should have any other questions. And most of all, I, I really can't wait to greet you in person um, in the coming school year. Thank you.